So if this video gets, let's say, 200 likes, then the next challenge I upload to this channel, at least for bug fables, will be playing through the entire game with every bug using Lifestealer. Except this time, no items. And we'll even do another mystery run, how about that? I mean, I will do this challenge eventually anyway, but it does warm my heart to see how much you care about this video, so... Well, I sure am happy. Thank you for the likes on my Lifecast Edition video, everyone. In this video now, every character I use equips Lifestealer and cannot use items. Not just in battle, but not consumable key items either. And like GM Neko requested, this run will be done in mystery so medals are randomly ordered. Now, as we trot through Chapter 1, no doubt you're aware that my attacks are doing a lot of damage. Yeah, Lifestealer has a rather nefarious drawback that reduces your attack stat by 1. This may not sound like a lot, but anyone who has ever played a Paper Mario game before where small numbers are everywhere will be able to immediately recognize just how hard this drawback really does hit. Not only does it make V, Kabu, and Leaf do less damage, but V in particular also loses a lot of utility, as she not only has to be in the front now for her Tornado Toss to do any damage, but she can use it only once per turn, as Exhaustion will cause her to do nothing otherwise. And since in this challenge I'm playing both on hard mode and without items in battle, because I guess I hate myself or something, it will force me to play conservatively with my TP, especially since HP and TP story medals were rather elusive in this run. I mean, you're free to look up the medals I would get next, but I didn't know when they'd appear. After all, my reactions are already super mild. If I lost any more energy from my reactions, I'd probably implode. I don't have those super grandiose reactions, that's what my editing is for. The reduced damage from Lifestealer naturally leads to much longer fights. At least we're prone to having more HP by the end of them. I guess, if we super block. Though when encountering multiple enemies, that's not so true. And it doesn't help turn relays much either, unless you really want one bug in particular to heal more. There's already a lot to process from this seemingly simple, still surprisingly stifling simulation. But bosses are where any challenge truly becomes noteworthy. Unfortunately, not for a very compelling reason, as bosses would just be dragged out for much longer. The first one, Spooter, is a prime example. Definitely a more slow fight, no help to the fact that I'm only ranked 2 and needed to rank up MP to even be able to equip all 3 life stealers. About the only real saving grace here is surprisingly the fact that earlier I found Kabu's boulder toss skill. Yeah, you can definitely tell Neko keeps up with my videos. I've lately come to find that this is the worst medal in the game. It's literally outclassed before you can even get it without mystery after all. But when it's available this early, it's difficult to argue with the power it affords and the spread damage being decently effective against Spooter's Summon Jolly Shroom. And being at least decent with most super blocks in this game, even Spooter's Poison Breath was not even that overwhelming. After roughly 5 minutes on this one boss, we defeated him. And now you have a rough idea for how long this challenge can take to complete. Man. Without being allowed to use items, berries often can only be spent on meadows in Marab's shop. So, though I don't know what medals I'll get, I at least know I'll be getting a lot of them. I won't mention every single one I find, but here's the seed I was given to enter at the start as per Neko's request. You can try and follow along on Ben Lubar's website, which I'll also link in the description down below this video. Now, the fight with the Wasp Scout is deceptively cruel because of Life Stealer being equipped on all my bugs. The only one who can even dent him is Kabu, thanks to his horn being powered up by enemy defense. But since doing only one damage per turn will be highly inefficient, because apparently I'm part bureaucrat now, I don't know, I like watching Futurama. It feels like Pebble Toss would be our saving grace today, as it's a metal that ignores both defense and exhaustion entirely, allowing us to hurt the Wasp multiple times in a turn. Ah, Pebble Toss. It conquers all the evil in the world, here included. I would know. I've done a challenge where I've used Pebble Tosses by only attacking hard mode because I'm a complete and utter nerd. We also have Empower by now, a low and Kabu's basic attack to hit for a jaw-dropping, heaven-rendering normal damage. If this sounds like a lot to say for one enemy, that's because it is. Now moving on further into Chapter 2 has a fair few fights to sift through. Arya is up first, and this is one of few times they would prefer V to leave. The simple reason is because V doesn't need TP to hit her, and I'm not going to waste my finite TP on attacking both Arya and her Vine when she can always bring it back. And the lower attack stat just means she'll have more opportunities to do just that. Helps her to Venus Bud too, since it flies after being attacked and... Yeah, this fight is slow enough. Being able to speed it up at all will be preferred. Another fight that demands patience with TP usage, but once we're in a comfortable position, it'll be no biggie. So far, a lot of fights just become more slow of a lower attack set, which is to be expected. Of course, if I was allowed to use items, it'd very much defeat the purpose of Lifestealer, so... What can you do? Well, the answer's obvious. 
suffer. Zasp and Mafiva for now, though, feel like an example of a fight that becomes drastically more tricky due to having less attack. And it's not hard to see why, either. Zasp has more HP, defense, and attack, making him harder to take down. And even if his HP is reduced to zero, he can be revived, and waste our efforts on taking him down first. But focusing on Mafiva buffs Zasp even more through charge up taking effect, and we're stuck doing maybe half of what we normally can do to her. It's a real catch 22 which demands being ready to adapt and not letting the fight drag on for too long, as Team Mafiva can wear you down very quickly. Honestly, a perfect fight for showing up what I'll be doing during the most difficult bosses later. Using TP early on is actually the tactic I opted for because the sooner the Mafiva's HP drops while we're healthy, the sooner we can focus on Zasp, we'll lose out on one avenue of receiving his buffs. This worked rather well actually because Kabu sees a lot of damage come his way earlier in the fight, and so Life Stealer allowed him to keep his health up when it really was time to change focus. A nice advantage to Life Stealer though is that even if your attack doesn't do damage, you still recover 1 HP for attacking. Kind of like HP Drain in Paper Mario 64. So though we're capped to only do 3 damage per turn, we can still restore 3 HP and even have some variance in who gets to 1 of the points. Funny enough, Zasp and Mothaba could have KO'd Kabu multiple times in the first attempt, but they didn't. It may sound lucky, but let's also remember that Zasp normally would be doing double his current damage. A lot of my success here could be owed to knowing how to piss Zasp off, but not too much. Yes, I am in fact a professional bully. It's important to know how much you should say to Zasp that his waifu is in fact dung, and Kabu sure would know it when he sees it. At least that's what Zasp says. But hey, I'm glad we can both agree that Mothaba belongs in the toilet. Compared to that nightmare though, Venus Guardian is back in the same ballpark as Spooner. Slow but largely uneventful. I wish I had something unique to say regarding it, but really it just has become routine how I fight this boss, exclusively with Kabu and Leaf until it goes airborne where V takes over. We now have access to optional bosses, but this early in the challenge, Mr. Scarlet is too powerful for us to survive his relentlessly high damage, coupled with healing that well surpasses what we're capable of. Especially once his HP falls to a value where he restores more than half. This fight isn't exactly impossible with Life Stealer and everyone, but the lack of items pushes it over the edge. Not even Frigid Copy would help enough at delaying the inevitable extra defense. We need more options so as to have even a slight chance to match this year's healing. Though I didn't know it at the time, Berserker was actually very close to being collected, and the next battle I found while in the Lost Sands was exactly that. Everyone comment down below, thank you to GM Mecha for his timely metal gift. With this, our damage output is effectively double what it normally is, and Kabu, despite being unable to guard, still sees himself not be targeted by Mystery outside of non-healing attacks, while V took most of the abuse instead. And though Lee's Fission Coffin failed to freeze twice, the third probability strongly favors the status ailment actually progging. And the move sure enough succeeded in freezing Mystery solid, leaving him to be at the mercy of Kabu's furious thrust, and subsequently brought down. And yes, Monsieur Scarlet's first name is actually Monsieur. I don't get it either. But with Monsieur out of the way, it's like calling him Sir. It's time to continue through the desert. We discover some more handy defensive meadows like the second Super Block Plus and front support. This early on, we struggled to fit the ladder due to the high MP cost, but it will likely save some use as we make our way forward. Berserker still proves to be useful as ever, however, when trapped in the Honey Factory, quickly wiping out the trio of Obama Honey. And though we're still without freedom in that sense, this game has also blessed me with a whole different avenue of death abuse thanks to Miracle Matter. This is a game-changing medal for this run. I wish I could say the same for a status mirror when I found it, but as I learned as I fought Honey Nation, a number of status emmas that bosses can cast seem to not really affect the boss throwing it out. I blame my first loss with Honey Nation due to a lack of knowledge. A Honey Nation isn't even really a hard fight, I just have difficulty actually processing information. But, if you ever saw me play Celeste before, I'm certain you already knew that. Autism, thy name is Phantom A. Now B33 was a boss. I really didn't have a clear vision as far as how to fight or be I'm throwing my defensive medals in V and super blocking you as much as possible. But, now that I have Miracle Matter, I decided to both hit and burst the current Kabu, some defensive medals in V, and block you on Leaf and we basically just made this a war of attrition. You're free to look down on me for using Miracle Matter here, but it really feels like I lucked out when I found it because it's saving me from having this fight involve a lot of luck and arguably twice the time it normally requires. And I feel like some sight can be cut for me when you consider how often Leaf is at 1 HP just for blocking you to keep him alive. At least once V33's defense drops, Tornado Toss can be used to speed the fight up. Though it's also here Kabu becomes much more susceptible to chaos of the attack increase, we have the resources to stay in control despite the pressure and secure another win. You see, killbots have a preset kill limit. 
Knowing their weakness, I sent wave after wave of my own men at them until they reached their limit and shut down. Kif, show them the medal I won. So far, we've been making steady progress through the story with only some occasional hiccups. But I feel we could use some more enrichment in our lives, so Mother Chomper. As tradition on this channel, we'd like to claim custody of the baby drop from this boss to assist us in our travels. But before we can acquire Princess, we must kill her mother. You know, like Lord Farquaad in that one DreamWorks movie. Yeah, that's PG enough. Problem though is we don't have access to items in this run, and that means we can't cheese it with Shock Trooper and Taunt. Back to the basics, I guess. Though I wish so many super blocks weren't necessary to win. Not wasting 5 TP at a harmless hurricane toss would have also been preferred, too. Just saying. Regardless, Mother Chopper was defeated, and shortly afterwards we say hello to Princess. Funny thing about her is that she actually has the strongest attack set of any of my bugs in this game because of the pretty ribbon. Expect her to carry us a ton later on. Though for the fight with Astopheles, it really doesn't matter much. We're already doing our whole challenge run with all items allowed, so there's really no added gimmicks here. It's an extremely easy battle, albeit with poor V facing the majority of damage being dealt, which was also the case with the Dune Scorpion coming up. Why does it feel like every boss just wants to bully V? That's Leaf's job. On the bright side though, shortly before meeting Princess, we found a hard charge, so that's a big plus. Let's fast forward to the Watcher because I have something fun to share. Here is where Status Mirror finally gained a worthwhile time to shine, but unfortunately it was equipped to V when I wanted it equipped to leave since he donned Berserker in this fight now. Fortunately, we still got to use the metal to a decent effect, since it seems a lot of bosses just want to bully V for some stupid reason. Keep this up and at some point, V may write a manifesto with your names in it. Case in point, Status Mirror proved to be a super effective method of immobilizing the Watcher, as when he's frozen by Status Mirror, He's frozen for longer than we are. It's even worth it not to block Ice Falls, as despite the massive damage we collectively take, it happened late enough in the fight where my Berserker Leaf and everyone else were able to just thaw out and subsequently crush the Watcher like a roach under my shoe. Is that offensive to roaches in this game? If so, good. Princess even got to score her first boss knockout, a rousing success for our team. We now can begin Chapter 5, but not without some meadows that may make a significant difference in how we play the game from now on. I'm talking about meditation. Now, only one would be a nice enough addition already, since we have no TP restoring options at all at the moment. Oh my gosh, we found the second one! Oh, this will be fun. A means of steadily restoring TP is something we've been desperate for. And now we can restore 2 TP per turn just for making like Luigi. Which is a huge advantage when only Berserker is in the front character will be seeing a chance to do any damage anyway as defense becomes more common later in the game. Time for Mr. Beast, the boss of Chapter 5. Oh wait, that's not right. Time for Mr. the Beast, the boss of Chapter 5. This boss makes an excellent showcase of the power of Needle Toss of Hard Charge and Meditation backing it. We have a reliable source of good damage, and don't even need to stay at low HP where we'd be at risk of getting KO thanks to V's secret stash. Leaf isn't much of a fighter here, but he can at least uproot the beast if he burrows underneath the ground. And if he is needed for that, well he can't do damage if he isn't in front, but we have meditation now, meaning he's able to contribute to the team by doing absolutely nothing. Just about all of our bases felt like they were covered, as whatever the beast could do, we could counter it. The fight itself wasn't even that much longer than some earlier fights in the game. Talk about efficiency. Meanwhile, I'm not really of the opinion that General Ultimax is an interesting fight by comparison. About all that needs to be said for Chapter 5, really. Not very long, but it's got some awesome music, at least. And we also received Status Relay, which honestly could not have come at a much better time when we start going at our optional boss rush after Chapter 6. For now, the fights in Chapter 6 are numerous, with Primal Weevil being the first among them. Felt like now would be an okay time to experiment with some new toys like TP Saver, Royal Decree, and Fly Drop. The former two are great, the other one, well, is nerfed by Lifestealer without actually benefiting anyone. I really can't think of much else to say. I didn't play as well as I feel is expected of me, though, having both V and Leaf get knocked out once apiece. And yes, I can't say that despite super blocking the War of Time, Princess even got the KO. Otherwise, this is arguably the least noteworthy fight in this current chapter. I mean, you'd be wrong, but you could still argue it. Though I don't think anyone is going to seriously call the Plumpling and Mimic Spider anything special. Cross and Poi you'd think would be more notable, but aside from technically being considered mini-bosses, which means an additional KO for Princess, they really only existed to give me a chance to max up my TP from the last fight. I didn't do that though because I'm not that scared of Zasp and Mothiva. But it does say a lot when I end the fight better off than the last one. 
Unfortunately, despite being significantly more powerful and accompanied by the best fighter ever, i.e. Princess, this fight went largely identically to the previous encounter in Chapter 2 in practice because Leaf was knocked out, preventing me from finding an opportunity to freeze Zasp so as to cut him off from the permanent plus with attack from Optima Falling. And the relentless attacks from Zasp forced me to rely heavily on Secret Stash to keep Kabu alive in case the worst happened. Princess really ended up putting in a lot of work at reducing Zasp's HP, while the rest of Team Save Up was preoccupied with survival. And though we won the fight, it took over 10 minutes for Team Mouth of Asar to finally burn out. You smell that, right? This foul, smoky odor. In this foul, bowl like arena underneath what looks like a mound of poo. Well, how about that? Mouth of Us took my advice. See, Zasp, you owe me 10 bucks. The next boss we encounter won't be for a while, as the game requires us to explore Rubber Prison before the Chapter 6 boss. Afterwards, though, General Ultimax within his tank engages us. The fight at first went fine as Kabu was on the offensive with Leaf buffing him and V on support restoring our TP. But after the tank fell below half HP, it charged and rammed into us as if it was fresh out of Tiananmen Square, slaying both V and Leaf instantly. I probably should have revived V, but I thought nothing of her and decided to just keep rushing at the tank until it fell. Which fortunately wasn't too out there to hope for thanks to Leaf equipping Miracle Matter. Princess even scored the KO on the tank before Leaf went to finish Ultimax himself off, ending the fight and Chapter 6. With the game then telling me this challenge wasn't hard enough, I decided, eh, fair enough. Time to challenge the optional bosses in this game. All 11 of them. 11? Oh god, I just realized how many that actually is. Uh, where to start? Well, as far as bounties go, False Monarch was amongst the most difficult. With his insanely high HP and multiple hits thanks to Mothflies, there really is no easy way to go through him. Or, well, them. It's 2023, I can't assume pronouns anymore. The Mothflies they can summon to later on heal them only further complicates matters, as you likely already know the reason why. If you can't guess, remember what challenge you're currently watching. We have the tools to win, but it took freaking forever to do, being forced to rely on hard charge enabling Kabu's last sand medals, and passing them to V whenever possible, who can really only pray to her damage combined with princesses can do False Monarch in. The sad thing is that the successful attempt wasn't even 10 minutes long, but after over 15 minutes of failure, yeah, it wears on you. A long fight, even with hard charge equipped, is a real sign that the rest of the bosses before Chapter 7 will be similarly problematic. Right? Well, no. Ceiling King went largely better than False Monarch did because his attacks and that of his minions were much softer than what the False Monarch could dish out. Even the attack drop from his hard seeds largely didn't matter because last attack cancels the drop out and phase 2 hardly that's anything that would make this fight any harder. Not when I'm generally decent at super blocking, to put it mildly. Princess scored a KO here also. May not be entirely earned, but she deserved it after her efforts against the False Monarch, so let's let Greedo just spoil her and throw her a bone. That's bounty number two cleared. We could keep up the theme, but my viewers demanded Zama fall next, which also means we're all getting Ice Rain. If you think this trivializes the whole challenge from now on, just remember to move still cost 11 TP to execute, and my attack is hindered with eye items off limits. Now for Zomoth. Starting this fight, I wanted to try something goofy to lead off with, so I put Kabu in front to taunt Zomoth and take both hits from Zomoth's poison. He'd be low on HP and poison, but V can just heal and be relayed the attack drop since she's a worse fighter than Kabu here anyway due to Zomoth's defense power. As you can see here, Ice Ring does do good damage, but with how much of a strain it puts on my TP, it's highly impractical to repeatedly use. You also likely have already picked up on this, but the only status that can be mirrored back to Zomoth is poison, so the attack and defense drops that can be cast on our party will only affect our party too. Those highlights aside, this boss really was just slow of Princess sometimes being walled off by summons, and slow is the word that seemed to define this whole challenge really. I'd love to just bite and suck the blood out of this thing, but all we can really do is scrape and lick. Kinda like Dracula. I didn't want to waste any time with getting V and Liu's quest dealt with after all this transpired, and believe it or not, we're only now starting to see some half decent poison medals like Poison Defender and Eternal Venom, none of which would be particularly useful for Kali and Kavu, but they'll be useful for some later bounties, I'm certain. This fight was just V using Tornado Toss multiple times after being buffed by Empower, probably the easiest boss so far. Carmen, it wasn't much harder. The only thing I learned is that her turn being cancelled off by being woken up doesn't apply if she gets frozen and broken out in the same turn. At least she got her revenge on this during the Spike Hearts tournament, before crushing her with a deck that I came up with myself to save the trouble of returning to my submarine. Sand and PC may as well be irrelevant, though I may have given Princess another KO here just to encourage her to fight on, but don't tell her that. 
I bet I see a single comment down under this video trying to tell the princess I did this for her. Let her keep her confidence. And then the last of the mini bosses, Riz. And this fight actually ended up being pretty annoying since I can't just cheese him with Frostbite now. At least until I decided to remind this game that I'm a professional bully, so I went with something a little more crude. I ended up just relying on V's status medals and own rails with some accu pressure. Didn't work at first, and V predictably was quickly killed turn 1, but Kabu and Leaf managed to hold their ground as V recovered, no doubt thanks to Fridge with Coffin. Riz then was numb, sedated, poisoned, and overall subdued. I may have also made another oopsie in my damage dealing, but again, don't tell Princess that. Can't ever think I lost my touch. Now that many bosses have all been squashed, it's time to return to grinding the last few optional bosses. My next target is Tidal Worm. I opted to place a lot of my energy using Ice Rain and Hard Charge, a bona fide Tidal Worm Exterminator, Life Sealer be damned. Princess also scored another KO, but this time it was all on her. Peacock Spider is second to last on the chopping block, and with HP this high at a point of defense, it's another fight that takes predictably a very long time. I just went in with Miracle Batter on V and had her hard charge and then while Peacock Spider rinsed and repeats. Kabu predictably just sat there and basically pissed Peacock Spider off as she must have been wondering why he refused to really move or die. All around still shorter than False Monarch took, but 15 minutes is 15 minutes all the same. There's still one bounty left, but Broodmother is a boss all the same, so we should check her out. Not all that challenging, we just rely on poison and sleeping needles to keep Broodmother from summoning her midges. And it shows how effective that plan was, because she immediately summoned her midges the first turn she wasn't asleep. It was from there just a few more hits, with Hard Charge even seeing action on Leaf for his Icefall skill, which even ended up freezing Broodmother solid, setting up nicely for Princess to KO her as the rest of the midges fell shortly after. And finally, we reach the final bounty boss of the game, Devourer. Most of this fight was just Leaf auto-reviving and striking the main body with his Berserker power basic attack, while Kabo uses the team skills allowed to him, allowing us to hit hard twice in a single turn. Given the Valor's below average HP and lack of chances to heal itself, this fight ended rather quickly. And guys, guess what this means? All the bounties are dead! And the last few medals I found had some that feel like slaps to the face like Poison Touch after finishing the last boss fight where that could have been potentially useful. But at least we got a second Miracle Matter medal, which is funny because you normally get it at the Rude Mother. There's nothing else to do before Chapter 7, which, funny enough, everyone is here waiting for us still after beating Ultimax. Apparently, I even forgot the Flame Brooch. Whoops. Well, we're at the end now, Chapter 7. You know the music that plays here? Not a big fan of the Deadlands. Never really was. And having since played Pizza Tower, it's even easier to say that when I can directly compare it to Don't Make a Sound. I really like Pizza Tower. The ambush of Deadlanders at least offers some intrigue as I did lose the first time, mostly due to misplaced priorities. What do I mean by that? Well, I first tried to focus on the Deadlanders Gamma and Beta. I reasoned this would be smart because the Gamma has the most HP and was potentially the most deadly of the three, so Kaoni should take priority. However, this gave us a problem when we still had to eat attacks from both the Alpha and Gamma, who both hit insanely hard. The missed block on Leaf leaving him to fall and forcing us to use TP to KO the Gamma immediately left us in a pretty bad spot, and the Deadlander Alpha would later opt the burrow under the ground, rendering both Maki and Princess incapable of helping us at all. Especially when Kabu later would miss his block and get numbed while V could do nothing to survive but she was hit by it all. By focusing instead more on the Alpha and Beta, we take significantly less damage from here on out. Princess even scores an additional KO, and Maki gets to be consistently useful. Good time is had by all, even the enemy, at least in the first attempt. A one round KO on the fire constructs later, and the only thing left for us now is the final boss fight, leading us to the Wasp King. At its simplest, my goal in this fight is just to beat him. I must drop the strongest attacks I can, supplement them with hard charge, and just try to bury him. With mixed results. There is no doubt Leaf was going to be hit hard if the Wasp King willed it. Even from max HP and a super block, he can't survive Hoax's Slayer, and when he falls, our offense slows to a crawl. This may be another fight where I wish I had status mirror equipped, but I didn't think that far ahead. Of course, my inability to super block some attacks later did not help matters either, and I ended up losing with less than 20 HP to go. The second attempt went much more smoothly. I was mostly using the same strategy. However, I opted for Frost Relay now as a method of taking advantage of my one last attack to buff both Leaf and Beast Strikes, so the least they each do is 2 damage per strike. 29 damage for 10 TP seems much more worth it than 25 damage for 11, after all, when you factor in the odds of freezing. 
We got a bit out of sync near the end, but it hardly mattered thanks to Princess reducing the Wasp King's HP to where V was no longer necessary. I'd love to say we're done here, but the Wasp King isn't. So he in desperation does eat the wilted sapling and is reborn as the Everlasting King. You're likely tired of hearing this, but our reduced attack power thanks to Life Sealer is going to force us to play around how the Everlasting King actually heals, both at the end of his turn and when he steals our HP to add to his own. Normally what I do is launch him into the air so he can't heal from us, but that allows him to summon the artifacts, and we need to see to it Kabu isn't cut clean in half if Hulk summons both halves of the key. So I resort to instead have Leave just stall his healing by attacking while he's on the ground. So when Kabu charges his TP up, he can relay his hard charge while still being at a safe HP value, and Leaf can hit where it hurts, his ice weakness. If Leaf ever does get KO'd and the Wasp King flies back into the air, well that's where V comes in, since she doesn't need TP or even to do damage to force the Wasp King down to the ground. And Princess does fine in limiting his healing. I wish I remembered the poison needles here honestly, they're super effective against this boss. That or the Venom Ribbon anyway. There's also occasions where the Everlasting King summons his tablet, doesn't really matter. I can always hold off on passing rate hard charge if we can't hurt the boss, and two attacks plus Princess generally will be enough to take it out. So long as we repeat this process and don't deviate too much from the plan, we'll be sailing like smooth. At the end of Phase 2, I do make the conscious decision to send the Everlasting King back into the air because he always summons both the key halves in Phase 3, so maxing out my TP and having a hard charge ready really only makes sense. A bit more back and forth saw the fight end after about 15 or so minutes left. Probably not one of the harder fights I've done, but one heck of an endurance test. And we can now confidently say bug tables can be beaten with everyone equipping Life Stealer. You know if you hack the medals in, otherwise obviously it's impossible. And just because I normally do this, let's also fight Team Mackies and Slacker with everyone equipping Life Stealer too. So surrounding Team Mackie, this fight was winnable through the use of Do Nothing Medals and Miracle Matter, as well as a bit of tomfoolery with Poison courtesy of Kina. Saying this fight or the one with Team Slacker dragged on at this point of the video would be redundant. Just know that to make the fight feel the slightest less tedious, I tried to take advantage of stuff like Poison Touch and Status Mirror, but neither really did much, mainly thanks to Yin repeatedly healing status summons on her team. I probably should have tried out Spiky Bot here. Either way, Kabu's Understrike was excellent here when combined with Hard Charge. We couldn't take Yin out, but she never really needed to be downed anyway. This just leaves Team Slacker, which... Wow. This fight sucks. Like, really sucks. First of all, while Team Maggie can be formidable, you can generally survive Maggie's attacks with some healing so long as your blocks are on point, and there are less attacks to worry about with a much more manageable charge mechanic Kina can benefit from, while Stratos can just up and drop your defense, while Delilah can buff his attack and threaten you with a slew of dangerous status summons you can't really work around if you miss a block. Not even status mirror helps much here when the effects last longer than Delilah would suffer from them, and unlike Team Maggie, It'd actually be dangerous to rely on Spiky Bot because when either Team Slacker's fighters fall below half HP, they attack twice in a turn. You'd be hard pressed to survive a flurry of swings from either of these two. And though I didn't want to admit it, my stream chat had a point where the last thing I needed was less defense, which I'd be putting up with if I continue with Reverse Toxin. So to win, we went with a plan that depended on Last Sand and Reflection. These medals allowed Kabu to take almost anything without fear of damage if his HP is low. And the few times he does take damage, we can use V's stat skills to restore specific HP values and keep him out of real danger, as well as prime him the hard charge so when Leaf is standing, we can pass to him and make progress in the fight. This sounds like a foolproof strategy, but my MP isn't actually sufficient to protect completely from Shadow's sword, and we like the TP to consistently attack. There would be times where we need a last resort option in case we are at risk of actually losing, and that's where Princess comes in, who is now flaunting her drowsy ribbon. This key item gives her a starting 50% chance of sedating Stratos and really putting the slacker in his team name on display. Near the end of the fight, this very weakness to sleep allowed Kabu to just barely survive an otherwise lethal attack. If that isn't an example of the sheer dominance Princess can display, I don't know what is. After a long, drawn-out battle, it was all down to a single fly drop to allow the tag team of Kabu and V to pierce the Elytra of Stratos and send him down and out. And though the means of my victory may have been questionable, there was no doubt that it was not just my own, but that of my support group, namely my stream chat and princess. Thank you all for being a part of my clutter. So, the question now I guess remains as what will I do next in this game?
Well, to be honest, I don't know, and I'm not sure if I'll be challenged running Bug Fables much anymore either. It was fun, gave me a lot of material to make videos on, and I feel like we've managed to uncover a lot about the game through what I and others have found out about the game. But I also feel like I may just not be particularly interested in continuing with the game since it's been a few years, and I doubt there's really much more room to grow anymore by playing it. If you've been on this channel since the start and this is how you found me, I want to thank you for giving me the time of day and supporting the game just for keeping up with me. And if I moved you to buy the game, I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. This won't be my last Bug Fables challenge though, I don't really want to quit playing the game until I've hit 1000 hours on Steam, and I'm not that far away from that, but I feel like it may just be worth knowing for you all who want to know when I actually will quit Bug Fables. And when that time does come, well, at least you'll know when it does happen. I'd like to give a thank you to MB Switchy and Splash A for continuing to pledge through the channel, so thank you both for your $10. Till next time, this is Phantom A, and thank you for watching.